Um, perfect. Hello. Hi. How are you? Uh, welcome to the NYU Game Center guest lecture series. Uh, tonight, we're very excited to have three of the key creatives from the new Bioware game, Dragon Inquisition, Dragon Age Inquisition. And uh, we're extremely uh, uh, happy uh, to have them join us and talk about uh, the creative process behind that game and uh, with a focus on storytelling and, and how that is uh, uh, integrated into the gameplay and into the overall process of creating a, a large scale game like this. So um, before we begin, uh, a couple of announcements. Uh, I want to uh, thank uh, our sponsors, the people who make the, the Game Center lecture series possible. Um, <coughs> Avalanche, Fresh Planet, Take-Two Interactive, We Play Dots, and Gigantic Mechanic. Please uh, join me in thanking them for sponsoring us. And um, I also want to thank uh, the nice folks at BioWare and EA for helping set up tonight's event. And uh, I want to mention that uh, the NYU Game Center is, uh, has a, a two-year MFA in game design, which is a wonderful program here. Uh, we, are, uh, for, we are in the process right now of accepting uh, applications uh, for admission for next fall. So uh, if any of you want to go to grad school and, and study game design, I encourage you to apply if you know any talented people who are interested in, in doing that, please send them our way. And uh, in addition to that, uh, next fall, we are going to be opening the doors of our undergrad uh, degree for the very first time. So this is a four-year BFA in game design, which is going to be starting next fall. So if you know any talented high school students who are about to graduate and would like to study game design, we are interested in talking to them. So please send them to us. Um, all right, so uh, without further ado, uh, I'm going to bring out tonight's guests. Uh, they are creative director Mike Laidlaw, lead writer David Guider, and the actor Freddie Prince Jr., who plays the voice of Iron Bull. So please. Freddie, thank you so much for joining us. Um, here's the format for tonight's uh, event. Uh, we asked uh, each of these folks, the creative director, the lead writer, one of the main actors, uh, to each uh, choose a, a scene from the game uh, that they thought was particularly interesting, that kind of reflected one of the things that they felt the game was going for creatively. And so we're gonna have each of them kind of uh, set up the scene, talk us through, uh, play a little bit of it so we can, all of those who are not currently playing the game, who are finished playing the game, uh, can kind of get a taste of what this game is all about. Uh, and yeah, we're going to try to avoid spoilers. <laughs> Might be a little spoiler <laughs> action. But if you uh, ask the lead writer for his favorite scene, you're yeah. going to get spoiled. You're going to get spoiled. <laughs> so, it's going to happen. Um, so now I, uh, I will mention a couple of things before. So, before we do that, um, let me just mention that we're, we have a new kind of audio set up here. We're streaming, so hello to everyone on the internet who's watching. Um, but uh, we only have one mic uh, that's picking all of us up. So, just, so we're gonna have to speak up and I'm asking all of us to project. Freddie, you're gonna be fine, but the rest of us, I'm sure, are gonna have to struggle a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Mike and I are such wall speak up. Yeah, <laughs> Give me a little more. So, um, all right, so here's the thing about, let me just say about Dragon Age. Uh, so I'm playing this game, Dragon Age Inquisition. Uh, I'm really enjoying it. And one of the things that's great uh, about, we really love when there's an opportunity to bring in people from the creative team of a, of a game that's just recently launched, right? So we're, um, you know, when, and, and especially I think a game of this scope, a game of this scale, uh, a, a, you know, a triple A, capital B, capital G video game product, you know? So often, when we play games like this, they come to us as these very beautiful, polished, uh, you know, products 
of the industrial entertainment complex, right? We, we get them, we, we like, are immersed in this incredibly uh, rich and, and the, the, the high production values and this, you know, this kind of beautiful, uh, incredibly uh, engaging and immersive world. Um, but there's, I think, you know, there's a, there's a quality that this game that I'm getting from, from Dragon Age Inquisition that I often don't get from AAA games, which is that there, I don't, for me, there feel, it feels like there's more heart in it, right? Um, I still feel there's kind of an old school vibe uh, with this game in the sense that there's a, uh, there's a, a human touch that I'm feeling as playing through it. It's partly, I think, uh, the, 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 the fact that it is, uh, it's possible to get lost in this game, right? This is not the kind of game that leads you by the hand, right? A lot of AAA games uh, really do feel almost kind of over-designed in that the way that they guide you through, the way that they, they uh, kind of create this experience for you, this very finely engineered experience. This is a game with so many interesting overlapping systems. This is a game with, uh, that, that, has, that uh, emphasizes uh, player choice and exploration. Uh, and, and it's a game that allows you to kind of wander around and bump into uh, surprising and interesting things. And, and it feels like a game made that still has that vibe of when video games were made by hobbyists, by enthusiasts, you know what I'm saying? And, and I think there's a, there, this is a, a quality that, in some ways all games uh, have this interesting blend of their, their ambitious engineering projects, and then they're also creative projects, right? So it's, it's almost like, when I play this, I'm feeling like, it, it's like I, I see this as, as being a project of great ambition. Like it's almost like you're, I'm interested in hearing about this, uh, how it was put together, because it's like assembling a battleship in one sense, but it's like composing an opera in another. You With know this what I mean? music behind you while you're talking. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's, so loud. it's like a speech for your soldiers going to battle right now. It's awesome. Oh, I love it. It's not awesome. falter. <laughs> your so. games will not suck. <laughs> that I can't be heard. I feel like I'm overshadowing. No, it's great. Right. All right, so, all right. so that's, that, was my, that was my big setup. That was my aria. And, uh, and, but, you know, so, so that's why I'm excited to kind of like hear from you guys about like a peek behind, you know, inside the factory where, where this battleship slash opera is, is assembled. And, and, and learning what, what the humans are like that actually put this thing together and make it into this thing that we love. So, um, I am gonna start with you, Mike, right. okay? So, uh, you're the creative director. First, maybe just give us a really quick uh, overview of <coughs> what you do, what's your role on the project, <laughs> and then... <laughs> okay. <laughs> give us, give us a, just a quick overview of, 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 of your role on the project, and then set up the, the scene that you selected to show us. Sure. Uh, so, as creative director, I'm basically part of the, the three-headed beast that is um, the, the project leadership. Uh, so, we're structured, we have the executive producer who's basically in charge of all of it, right? And someone has to be able to make the final call. That's Mark Dara, um, a man who is exceedingly, <coughs> exceedingly tired right now. Because uh, he kind of has to ride the missile right into the sun, you know? That's, that's really his job. Like, Dave and I get to finish a little earlier. Uh, so then you have the, the technical director, the art director, and myself, kind of in, kind of handling all the different elements of content, right? The technical director is all the programming, all the engineering that goes into building all the structures, um, putting up with my crazy asks is a big part of his job. Uh, and then you have uh, the art director, Matt Goldman, who, who handles basically everything visual. If you can see it, it's all part of his design and his team works on it. Uh, and then design, uh, which is the creative side of things, is where we handle the gameplay, the story, the character development, and all those systems that kind of drive you through, be it the, the war table, crafting, uh, combat, all that stuff falls under my purview. Uh, so that, um, for me, kind of means that, that, that it's, it's a process of constant iteration and uh, coming up with an idea, testing it, prototyping it, seeing how it works, uh, you know, trusting a team to kind of drive it home, to try and own it, setting up champions. Who, can, who really loves this idea? Who wants to see it work and survive? Because that's usually when you get your best results, is having someone who, who has some, like you said, has some heart in it. 
Um, and then driving those ideas uh, forward to fruition and being able to you know, work with the quality assurance department and handle the polish, making the tweaks where necessary, and as, as Dave would tell you, occasionally hitting the story with a sledgehammer to make it make more sense or to be more compelling for the player. Right? And we actually had a, a sledgehammer meeting that was unpleasant, and yet it made the game better, so uh, worthwhile. Dave may disagree, but anyway. Uh, so the, the scene I picked is uh, it's a scene from very early on in the game, and so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do the burden of what, what is Inquisition? It just so I know, show of hands, who's, is, have most of you been playing it, or like am I? Okay, okay, that's really cool. Uh, thank you. I uh, appreciate you buying the game. Uh, hopefully you bought I got it for free. Yeah. <laughs> they, they made me buy Mass Effect 3. Yeah. <laughs> to do all those pull-ups. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, so Inquisition, for those of you who haven't played it, uh, is, is uh, a high fantasy uh, game set in, uh, in a world that's kind of always on the verge of destruction. Something horrible is always happening. Uh, it's a world in which everything comes with a price. That's kind of been one of our mantras. Nothing's, nothing's cheap, nothing's easy, um, and nothing is certain. That's a big part of the Dragon Age world, is that a lot of the most important things are tied to the idea of faith. And, uh, belief and that history is mutable. These are things that, that actually Dave set up very early um, in the first Dragon Age game, which was Origins. Uh, the very first line ever spoken is the Chantry teaches us that and it goes from there. And that's that's actually I think one of the key watchwords is that history is not necessarily true. We don't have a source book that tells you exactly how it went down. We always try to make it an idea about perspective. So, with that in mind, one of the major themes we're exploring in Inquisition is one of faith. One of uh, uh, if, if people told you you were the chosen one and you had no evidence to that effect, what would you do with that idea? It's a twist on, a, on an old trope, right? Usually, oh, you're the chosen one because of prophecy, and everyone goes, okay. Uh, that didn't seem very realistic to us, so we asked, what would you do if someone told you that? Would you disagree? Would you agree? And the game lets you play both sides of that. So one of the things the Inquisition does as an organization is it founds itself Basically, after a, a, a cataclysm, this massive destruction has opened up a hole in the sky, there's demons pouring out into the world, and no one seems to want to step up to fix this problem, because it's a very real problem. It's killing people, it's terrorizing stuff, it's ripping apart you know, alliances, and uh, the Inquisition is found to fix this problem. And one of the things we wanted to get across very early on in the game, because we're going to jump into what essentially is the prologue of the game, the opening beats to establish it, is that you were not a religious organization. Because, of course, the word inquisition is, is pretty loaded, right? That is, that is not a light word. Um, and we want to make sure that this inquisition, this is something that we were very clear about early on, was more about you know, answering questions, uncovering the truth, dragging things that are corrupt in, out into the light, rather than being, you know, torture, torture, torture. <laughs> so one of the things we did early on is we set you up in direct opposition with the church of the Dragon Age world, the Chantry. And uh, we, we were kind of talking about this idea, and what we realized very early on is that this wasn't going to work unless we had an actual representative of the church, someone that was a character that could embody kind of what you either stood against or maybe stood for, um, and that could, could kind of get up in your face a little bit with this idea. Uh, so earlier revisions of the opening didn't have this scene, and it, it, it always kind of felt worse without it. And so we introduced the idea of the character Chancellor Roderick. And I, I can talk a little bit more about you know how that changed, but it's probably better in context having seen so, it. Let's start it off. If you would, Chase. If you would. <laughs> yeah. All right. Chase is our guy. He's playing. He's hiding. Well, he's leaning on Donkey Kong Jr., <laughs> which is appropriate. <laughs> we got most of the crashes out. <laughs> Trevor Morris did our uh, our music for the game, just incredibly. He he, uh, he didn't work on the first two, but we tried it for the third one, and it, it is just fantastic. He's, uh, he's a bit of a fantasy nerd. Keeps poking me. Hey, can, can I get a sword? Can I get a sword for you? Because he's worked on Vikings, he's worked on Tudors, he's, he keeps working on these kind of historical franchises, so he wants weaponry. <laughs> one sword, yeah. yeah. At least one. Oh, we got him. We got him. All right, okay. I didn't get a sword. <laughs> you got a copy of the game. I did, I did. 
And the opportunity to romance yourself and Trevor Morris. Did you tell me? I just got told to go f myself. <laughs> no. Would I ever do that? We got Conan O'Brien as your inquisitor. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry. Go ahead. You made it. Chancellor Roderick, this is... I know who he is. As a <laughs> I hereby order you to take this criminal to Val Royo to face execution. Order me? You are a glorified clerk, a bureaucrat. And you are a thug, but a thug who supposedly serves the chancery. We serve the most holy, Chancellor, as you well know. Justinia is dead! We must elect a replacement and obey her orders on the matter. <laughs> None of you are actually in charge here. You killed everyone who was in charge! <laughs> <laughs> Call a retreat, Seeker. Our position here is hopeless. We can stop this before it's too late. How? You won't survive long enough to reach the temple, even with all your soldiers. We must get to the temple. It's the quickest route. But not the safest. Our forces can charge as a distraction while we go through the mountains. We lost contact with an entire squad on that path. It's too <coughs> risky. Listen, abandon this now before more lives are lost. How do you think we should proceed? Let's charge. If I say we charge, I will survive long enough for your trial. Whatever happens, happens now. Liliana, bring everyone left in the valley. Everyone. On your head be the consequences, Seeker. <laughs> So that scene is one that we reworked probably seven times, I think, over the course of the game. Uh, in various iterations, Cassandra is a lot more hostile against you. Uh, he doesn't exist. Chancellor Roderick simply fails to exist in variations of the scene, and Liliana is filling in with his role. Um, we've had uh, we had var variations where uh, Solus and Varric, who are two of your other party members, are way more involved than they were in this version. Uh, in each of them, what we were seeking was essentially that sense of, of really trying to get across three big things. One, this is a game about choices, and when you make choices, you're going to see different content based on those choices, which, which we just saw with the, if I charge on the mountain path, I go up, I get into a big burly fight, I get to meet Commander Cullen, who, who recognizes that later in the game. If I go the other path, I end up in a different scenario. I actually rescue the soldiers, that, the squad that we lost, according to Cassandra. So you want to get that point across. So this is a game where you can make decisions, and those decisions will have consequence in not just like based on a number, but based on the experience you have as a player. So it needed to do that. Number two, it needed to set up that initial opposition. And this was the thing that, as we did the rework, this is where we kept coming to more and more, is that we needed the sense that people weren't willing to step up and solve the problem. And Chancellor Roderick became literally the embodiment of that, right? We need to elect a replacement. Yes, that's how you deal with a crisis. We're going to go. We're going to go hold a vote and then form a committee to discuss what. Anyway, it's ridiculous. Uh, and I remember one of the things I love the most about that guy is is um, 
uh, that it, it felt like one of my clearer pieces of direction where I said to Dave and his team, what we basically need is the guy who shuts down the Ghostbusters <laughs> containment unit <laughs> from the EPA. He needs to be evil bureaucracy incarnate. And everyone went, oh, oh yeah, we need to be one of those, right? And that, that, that actually you mentioned that guy and all I can think of is when Bill Murray goes, it's true, this, this man, man has, has no, no dick. dick. <laughs> <laughs> that's all I can think of. Yeah, that's exactly it. So, um, trying to get him into it to again establish that major theme and have him and, it, and then I see as Roger keeps coming up as this sort of um, almost bureaucratic antagonist throughout the course of the game. Yeah. He's always showing up to go, oh, I suppose you think you're doing good, right? And he's, he's always kind of this d bag through the course of your adventure. Um, For the and first yet, part. For yeah, the first and part. yet and yet he is an old spoil. But I'm not just like, <laughs> Yeah, um, though I think your part may swallow that. Anyway, which would be an interesting, <laughs> interesting level. So, awesome. so just kind of recognizing that sometimes scenes have, they have to serve more than one master, right? We're teaching yeah. a chunk of gameplay while we're also trying to get a major theme across, and that, that there's so much iteration involved in trying to get that together. And I still, you know, I still think we could give it one more try, Dave. <laughs> it's not too late. It's not too late. No, it's really. Uh, <laughs> it's my all right, let's uh, <laughs> let's go to, to David next, and uh, maybe first tell us about like give us just a little bit of background on what you're how you're involved in the project and how you got started and and what you do on a daily basis. Uh, okay, I probably the person who's been on Dragon Age the longest. Uh, I started way back when we when Dragon Age Origins was just a, a, a fantasy twinkle in in, in Bioware's eye. <laughs> Uh, where they said, you know, go off and make a world that's sort of, kind of, sort of like Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. yeah. What not? Yeah. Uh, and I did. And I came back and I said, well, how about this? And they said, perfect. And first draft it is. Yay! Um, <laughs> that, that really happened? Yeah. Wow, that's, I've never, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That's but fair, it was a really good first draft. <laughs> yeah. And, and it changes and evolves. Like, like, there's, you know, people get added on to it and suddenly... Uh, we had so much lore accumulated, it was way more than one person could do. And I mean, uh, I'm the, the head of the writing team. Uh, and at the height of a project, I'll have up to seven or eight writers working underneath me. I mean, uh, the, the size of the, the, the amount of writing we put into our games, um, Dragon Age Origins had upwards of, of 800,000 words. Uh, this one, Inquisition, I think is a little bit smaller than that. I think it was about uh, 600,000. No, it was 750. Was it 750? Yeah. I didn't know there were that many words. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I had a lot. Well, like, and that's, that's just voice, because there's another 300,000 in the books. Yeah, there's all the codex <laughs> entries. Yeah. Yeah. Someone has to write words. all that. It's not just me. There's a lot of writers who work on this. A lot so, of us nerds read those codex entries. <laughs> <laughs> so really, it's a matter, uh, half my job is I, I, have, I have the same amount of writing tasks uh, as anyone, any one of my writers, like I, I wrote. Uh, if you played the game, I wrote Cassandra. I wrote Dorian. Um, I wrote the the prologue seven times. Well, actually, <laughs> <laughs> I only wrote the last four. I guess the, 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 we just switch writers. Um, you know, and, and, and so I have my tasks, but my job is also to coordinate the writers, uh, so that we we have uh, um, principles we work on, so that when you play. Unless you know the particulars of the writer involved, you shouldn't get a sense of, oh, this is a totally different writer. You should have a, have a, a flow that, that sounds like it, it was all written by the same person, even though it's not. Uh, there's a lot of, lot of uh, work on us putting our heads together. And I think most importantly, um, the, the thing you have to do, is, like when we talk about the prologue being written seven times, there's the, it's very rare that any part of the story it, it doesn't change by the time we're finished. The, as a game developer, it's not about who has the big idea. I mean, I, I could come and say, I got an idea for a story. It's about how you react to issues as they come up, because they are always going to come up. You're going to have to cut things and then figure out, okay, now that I'm missing the middle of my story, because that, that got cut because it just doesn't work, it wasn't working to me, didn't have time to replace it, or <laughs> you know, some, some piece of art that it totally relied on couldn't be done. So now we have this gaping hole in the story. Okay, uh, how do I fix that? And, and you know, and, and work with the rest of the team to try to try to still have, have the story make sense. And, and everybody has to be very agile because if I just you know started flipping tables and, and, and walking out saying I've had it with this, that's that's not going to get the game done. I've worked with that guy. <laughs> Actually, to be fair, Dave, we give you like an hour of that. <laughs> like, I'm just going to close the door. I'll be back. I have, and then you come out. And I have occasionally been in, a, been in a meeting like the sledgehammer meeting where I'm just sitting there and I'm like, I'm going to go in my office. <laughs> <laughs> just give me 
couple of days. <laughs> I will come back and I will be in a better space to deal with this crap. It's a grieving process. It's a, yeah, yeah. You, you will, especially, a especially process. sometimes you cut things that you, that you really are attached to. And, and it's like you know it's got to die. Yeah. You got to kill one of your babies just so the other ones can live. And and, and you do it. And, and you're just sitting there like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What <laughs> weapon are you holding right now? <laughs> <laughs> the murder knife. Okay, the murder knife. Right, right, right. There's only one. <laughs> or, or a sledgehammer, and I think yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, I just say, Mike made me do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so you, you, you just, uh, and sometimes you just got to let go of the story that you had in mind because I mean uh, everyone everyone Bioware games are very story driven but the story can't be the only thing there's no one master when it comes to the game I mean uh, the gameplay can't exist without the context of the story to make people care but we can't have the story alone without the the gameplay to support it to make it fun to get people invested in, in things like progression uh, the, 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 that we have to work to work together so it's, it's every now and again Somebody's on the chopping block and has to make the sacrifice, and by the end, by the time we're done, there's a whole lot of blood. <laughs> so, what's the scene you chose to show us? The scene was the one I was certain that was going to get cut, and did not. Uh, when we started off, and then this we're getting, this is a little bit spoilery because it, it is the the midpoint. Mm -hmm. It is the Empire Strikes Back portion of, of the the story where uh, the, the Inquisition that you've been building up, even though you're not the leader, uh, has a setback. And we, the, the, actually the temp name for the plot was called The Setback for the longest time and, until uh, uh, we, we started applying chantry quotes to all the, the plots. And it was the point where uh, we, when we talked about when we, when we first started back at the very beginning uh, doing sort of the larger arc of the story, we were like, okay, well, can we do a midpoint where the player is basically uh, uh, loses everything? When, when they are put back on their ass and they have that low, uh, a low moment where uh, everybody's like, oh my god, we're, we're done. We're defeated. And uh, when we were talking about the, the idea of faith in the game, um, we wanted to be even-handed. Because you have Chancellor Roderick, who, who comes off as sort of this <laughs> kind of you know, villain, and it's like, you could, we could paint faith and, and, and religion as villainous if we wanted to. That, oh, they're always obstructionist, and what's the, what's the point, what's the use of them? But I thought, if we could find a way to, to show that there is value in faith, that there is value in hope, and that hope could be what sort of propels the player back uh, on the, the, the second half of the game, where, where, they, they, where they suddenly it's like, oh my god, bro, it's, a, it's a whole new, new game. Um, and uh, uh, it was the first time I thought, can, 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 we, can we try a song? Because I'd, I'd never got a chance to actually do that before, and uh, somehow through all the iterations, it actually survived. And I think this is actually. Uh, yeah, now, now we can. Now we can really yeah, now we can. Yeah. yeah, you just. Uh, this is after the, the you met the the, uh, the the villain of the game. You the Haven, the original, the place where you started is destroyed, and you're kind of at the low points, going through through the, the mountains. I see that fire get blown out by the wind? <laughs> Little things like that are video game porn for me. <laughs> <laughs> sessions where like the whole like vocal thing we do is literally us going ah. <laughs> 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 the exertion palette. The exertion palette. <laughs> <laughs> like it's a whole it's a whole mission that we have because like takes an hour. <laughs> you know, the best thing is when the audio room is, is looping through and then they're mastering all those it sounds like someone's having sex in the <laughs> for sure. <laughs> <laughs> that are the worst <laughs> bathroom experience oh, of yeah. their life. <laughs> 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 you pass by in the hallway and you're like double take. Yeah. Are they working <laughs> So one one note on this sequence here is is uh, it's it's long and it's deliberately long. We went back and forth a number of times as to whether is it is it too much. But the thing is, it's just come off a very high note, right? Combat, big cutscene, um, and and 
the designer kept fighting with me. I'd, like, I'd be like, I don't know, man. I think it's too long. He was like, no, it really needs to come down. It's got to come down. You got to give the player a moment to kind of get, let that let the toxins get out of his system almost out of being in combat because the adrenaline's really high. And and as I played it more and more and it got more final and I was like, you know, actually, I think you might be right. We do need this slow moment to really sell the whole, you know. Yeah, you literally just had a fight where you're having to repair things within a, uh, within a stronghold and have direct battle with demons and you're having to do like 12 things at once and micromanage and then it literally smashes you to this. Sorry? All the 
Uh, we could probably just stop here. All right. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. A wise woman would eat it. Theo? <laughs> you, guys, you guys got skipped right there. <laughs> we'll, save, we'll save a few extra spoilers for you. Yeah, beautiful. Um, Freddie, why don't we uh, move on to you now? How did you get involved in the Dragon Age series? And uh, yeah, and yeah, what's what's your what's your um, role? All right, you ready? Uh, you know, I auditioned for it like anything else, um, and the original concept. You know, video games keep the things very, very secret. Um, and so you didn't know you were reading for Dragon Age. I think I was reading, I don't know what they called it, but, and it wasn't the, the Chargers, it was like the, the Blazing Bulls or something, <laughs> yeah, something like that. What's that? We, we changed the names for, for each uh, uh, person we sent it out to, so that there's a leak. You know, where it's That's where it comes from. That's great. <laughs> Star Wars did the same thing. It was like the Wolf Pack instead of Rebels, and it just read like a bad Thunder of the Barbarian episode. <laughs> <laughs> it sucks. Oh, it's Star Wars. I mean, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I, I went in to read for this, and, and the description had him very sort of alpha male and, and the opposite of the Kunari that, that, we're, that we've known and that we're used to. And my initial read, I wasn't nuts about, but I, I still was booked the job, but he was, I just did him very sort of, there was no real voice to him. He was just sort of an alpha jock who talked like this and just didn't care what you thought. And that didn't feel perfect to me and so when we I, I booked the job and I sat with with Caroline and we kind of discussed who this guy was and, and what he was and I kind of combined two accents there's this my daughter watches Mickey Mouse Clubhouse and uh, there's this character named Thunder and Pete and he always says hey Mickey the Mouse how you doing and it's a great voice actor this guy Jim was just incredible and I kind of combined that with Winston Churchill <laughs> <laughs> and sort of came up with this voice that, that went from Mickey the Mouse to all of a sudden he became the Iron Bull. <laughs> and it was something that just sort of organically happened with having a good relationship with Caroline, who I worked with on Mass 3. Um, she's really good with, with actors. She's, she's very <coughs> empathetic, even if she's not there. A lot of times I just get her in my ear. And uh, so we sort of get this, this character that, that these guys came up with in this dialogue that Patrick Weeks wants me to say. And you're looking at some of these lines and it's just like, if you've played the game, you know what I'm talking about. You're kind of like, all right, that's not James Vega at all. So, you know, the approach is one of, of trust with the director and you just sort of go for it and it ends up being some of your, your, your favorite lines, the ones that you were the most afraid of, right? Like what. And, I, and this is a good lesson for life. What you're most uncomfortable with, you should aggressively attack and pursue. And that's kind of that's kind of what we did with this. And we came up with this with this voice that sort of I had more and more fun with as as the game as the game progressed. And he was this character that I I fell in love with so much that there's without spoiling, there's a scene that I'm literally avoiding like the plague in this game because I know the choice I'm going to have to make. And it has to do with Bull, and I fell in love with this guy. You have to understand, like, actors, there are certain characters that they love, there are certain roles they play that they could care less about, there are certain roles they play that they hated, um, and everything in between. And this was a guy that I loved, and I don't want to spoil things because it is a very special moment, and you have to make that choice. And I refuse to make it. Like, I literally am doing every side quest I can around him <laughs> just to not have to put him in that position. Um, and so to describe him, you know, the original description was like that, he was Lawrence Taylor, basically, right? The, the old linebacker from the Giants. And he didn't care about your rules. He didn't care about your laws. He was Brian Bosworth if he made it, right? Like, if Bo Jackson didn't blow him up in that one game, right? Like, and he just sort of like walked away. And this, you're talking about a guy who walked, he's like a defrocked priest, right? He's like a, like a Ronin warrior, maybe something you guys are more familiar with where he serves no master but still is slightly under the control of the of the, the Kuhn government, religion, whatever you want to call it, whatever term you choose is fine with me. I don't believe in either. Um, <laughs> so, so we kind of came up with this guy who loves this world, loves humanity, loves drinking, loves getting drunk, loves having sex, loves having fights, loves he embraces that lifestyle and he's not ashamed of it. He's a mercenary. He's 
you saw the trailer, he's like, there's money on the horizon. Like, you know what I mean? Like, that's, that, that's his philosophy. And it's not until your inquisitor sort of proves themselves that he literally has these moments, and I won't spoil things, but he wants you to feel good about the job you're doing, and he takes you to intro he almost introduces you to your soldiers without them knowing who you are, so that you can get a sense of how you're affecting the people who believe in you. And and that's when you know you got it, right? That that's and that was sort of the magic about Bioware games is it brought accountability back, right? Like I'm old enough to be a part of the quarter generation where video games were designed for you to fail so they could get as many quarters out of your pocket as possible, right? And then the new generation is the God mode generation, right? Which is like, I don't want to ever die. We have easy mode, very easy mode, super duper easy mode. We have codes that give us a million bullets and a, and a million lives. And now we don't know how to deal with failure. And when you guys play me in multiplayer games and I kick your ass, that's why. Um, so don't, don't feel bad about it, just you know, embrace that. But what, what Bioware did, and, and I don't know if they were the first to do it. Um, I'm, I may be giving credit where it's not due, but that sort of character wheel and the, the old school philosophy of like the choose your own adventure books, which the author of those just passed away recently, a couple weeks ago, rest in peace. But uh, but if you're not familiar with those books, I mean, it's like, you know, if you if you agree to this aliens deal, turn to page 47. If you don't agree to it, turn to page 88. And that I literally, the first time I sat down with a Bioware game was Mass Effect. And I stopped, I dropped the controller and I was like, oh my God, it's, it's choose your own adventure. And I was hooked from that moment on because video games had zero accountability. You could kill, slaughter, hack, slash, smash, Dragon Ball Z, Kai, anything you wanted, right? Like, there were no repercussions for your actions, nothing, nobody cared. And if they did, it didn't matter. In a Bioware game, they'll leave you. <laughs> they'll be like, yeah, I'm gone. I don't like the choices you make, I'm not fighting for you, peace. And you literally have to take a step back and reload and make different choices or <laughs> be cool with the choices you made, right? Because you're confident in that character. And that's what made me, I sound like Matthew McConaughey when he's like, I played Bioware games. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I did, I, I really did. And that was a big attraction for it. So to get to grab, you know, grab onto this guy, the Iron Bull, and he had, so, and I love James Vega, but this guy has so much more depth and so much more heart and soul that he's willing to give you once you earn it, that it's uh, it's one of those guys I'll never forget. I mean, I'll, I'll be real with you guys. I do the voice just for fun. I do it, <laughs> I'm not joking, I do it just for fun. A buddy of mine was like, I used to memorize speeches when I was a kid. I loved like old, you know, whoever did it, but it used to be American speeches. I had Jesse Jackson's, uh, uh, when he was nominated, he wanted to run for president. And however you feel about him, that speech he made was unbelievable. That wouldn't work with the Iron Bowl voice. But Winston Churchill, money. So somebody asked me to do one of his speeches and change it up a little bit. And I literally did it on like a SoundCloud file. I think I tweeted it out. You can find it somewhere. But literally, it was straight up. We shall not flag or fail. We shall fight on to the end. And I just put in Ferelden instead of Franz. <laughs> we'll battle in the streets of all age. We'll battle in the hills. We shall never surrender. All that crap. But it's, you know, He's that kind of guy to me. He's Winston Churchill. He loves his drink. He loves to fight. He's had epic failures like Winston Churchill did early in his life. If, if you're familiar with history, if not, step it up. Um, <laughs> but for him to become this type of, not leader, but a person willing to take orders from someone who's earned it is what makes this game, is what makes Bioware games, not just AAA and capital VG, it makes them special, it makes them important, and it affects cultural change. Like these are the types of games that change the way other video games get made. And that kind of stuff is important. Like you rank, you rank your top five anything, and it should be because they had cultural change. Like my top five stand-up comedians, right? It's Lenny Bruce, because if there's no Lenny Bruce, there's no comedians. It's Richard Pryor, because he's the best. It's George Carlin because of his social change. It's Carol Burnett and it's Eddie Murphy. And those are my five. And you can, if you want to sub out Carol and, and Eddie for your other two favorite, that's fine. But those top three cannot be debated. <laughs> and my dad was a comedian. I ain't putting him in there. You know what I mean? And I love Robin Williams, but he's not in the top five. I'm talking about <coughs> cultural social change. And that's what these types of games have done. Think of the game, a game that you played that wasn't Bioware that had accountability. I played Deus Ex, I made choices, I didn't care. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? That cop was mad at me, he came to my apartment, shot him. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, hey, don't, don't mess with me. In these 
these games, it matters and you care, man. Like, it, it, it broke my heart. And I shouldn't say this because you won't hire me for another game, but in Mass 3, when, when the loyalty missions were gone, it was like, oh, 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 no. Like, and it freaked me out because in Mass 2, it was such a way to get to know these characters. And if you didn't do those missions, you were going to lose them at the end. If you haven't played the game, I just saved you a ton of pain. <laughs> um, but that's what it's all about for me, man. I'm, I, you know, I've played games, I'm old enough, I'm 38 years old, to have played the first video game to this. And I've seen how they've evolved, and I have very strong points of view on them. And when I see a game like this, and if you, if you follow me on Twitter, you know that I play. Like, I'm sending photos like... This is what I love. I show, you know, my daughter skydives in GTA. It's the only thing I'll let her do in GTA, right? <laughs> she, I'll do a private lobby and she'll jump out of a helicopter and she goes, Dada, what happens if I don't push the parachute? I go, well, you can see if you want. And, she, and my character splat and she cried. He <laughs> came back to life, she was okay. Everything was good. But, you know, I show these types of things to my kids and it just blows them away. You know, I showed her that trailer of, of Iron Bull one-shotting that giant, which you guys should let me do in the game, but you don't. Um, <laughs> and she literally, you know, she's like, God, it looks so real, Daddy, it looks so real. When she understands that, and, and I'm a graphics whore, like, if you make great graphics, I'll buy your game, but if it sucks, I'll tell you it sucks. And to get to have a game that's beautiful and gorgeous and give you, I told you I wouldn't stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> and it's gorgeous and beautiful, and it has story, and it's character-driven. That's game over, man. Everybody's seen, like, movies are now stealing from video games, whereas video games used to steal from movies. Like, you know, suddenly you're going to start seeing dialogue in the third acts of films, of action films. It's going to be crazy. <laughs> Somebody's going to talk. It's going to be weird. And that's because of games like this. It really is. And so that's, that's the long-winded version of, of, of why I love Iron Bowl and why, and, you know, why I just mark out so hard for these games. Awesome. Well, well, well said. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> The at. scene that I wanted is far too dirty and, sp and spoiling. <laughs> it has a lot to do with safe words, so you're not going to get to see that one. So um, you're going to kind of be more introducible. You're going to get to have a few drinks, and I'll probably drink you under the table, um, which in real life you all would drink me under the table. Um, but uh, yeah, the well, one I the one this I wanted. Is in, this is in reaction to your, like you were saying, like these characters kind of grow in affection. They earn yeah, them. man. This only happens after you've gotten to know Bull. Yeah, and enough. you don't get to just hang out with him. Yeah, you you literally you go to battle with him, and he talks to you about these battles you had. I mean, there's nothing he wants more than to kill a dragon. And if you do that with him on your team, I mean, even when you see it circling, he's like, "Can you see it in the sky?" And he's like, he's like a kid at Disneyland, right? So when you get a chance to drink with him, that's what you're celebrating about. It's not just, oh, let's have the random drink with the Iron Bull like in a lot of other games. It's all character driven and he talks about story a lot but what they do best is character driven games. Everybody's seen 24. The world's gonna end, the bomb's gonna blow up, and Jack Bauer's gonna save the day but we all know everything's gonna be okay and in video games they're brave enough to say no. <laughs> you know what I mean? No, that guy died and now you have to make changes. So let's watch Conan O'Brien talk about <laughs> I did a Twitch feed with Team Coco, and this was the character they created for Conan. Um, and so we went out and played, but it looked so much like Conan, I literally had to switch. And I don't play a rogue character, so I had to switch to melee so that I could go and fight this dragon on Twitch because I just can't be Conan. <laughs> I just can't. And I love the man. I just can't. I can't do it. Smile. Smile. Should be up to the right. This song is so addictive. I'm telling you, yeah. Lord, that's great. She sounds like Lord. It's great. There he is. That's his favorite seat. <laughs> Inquisitor, come have a drink. To killing a high dragon like warriors of legend. <laughs> <laughs> Smell of the fires burning. Toss it a thon, how some. 
You know, Kunari hold dragons sacred. Well, as much as we hold anything sacred. He's already drunk, yeah. by the way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Where's that Kunari fan? Take it, take it. Take you it. You want the Kunari phrase? I did. You shouted it during the fight, too. What does it mean? Oh, toss it up on how so. The closest translation would be, I will bring myself sexual pleasure later. <laughs> <laughs> Can't show my daughter this one. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> Not done drinking. Drink up. <laughs> the second cup's easier. Most of the nerves in your throat are dead after <laughs> The glorious ones. That's our word for them. Atashi. It's a shame we had to kill the dragon. Damn good fight. Dragons are the embodiment of raw power. But it's all uncontrolled. Savage. So, they need to be destroyed. Take me in the wild. Order out of chaos. <laughs> Have another drink. <laughs> 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 getting that approval too, baby. <laughs> To, to do my uh, sort of inside the, the game designer the studio, studio yeah. yeah, and um, and then we'll then we'll do some some Q and A from from the folks that uh, are here. But uh, I guess one of the things I want to ask about to begin with, if Andraste exists, yes, <laughs> what would you say? What would you want him to say? Her to say? Yeah. Her? Um, I guess uh, with a project this scope, uh, it's it just seems so daunting. You know, um, where does it start? Like, what's the first like, is there a is there a word on a whiteboard? Is there a theme? Is there somebody that says, okay, here's the idea of this new Dragon Age game. Like, here's yeah. the guiding star. Here's the principle. Here's the basic idea. Here's what's going to... Like, wh where does it begin? So, um, the leadership of the project typically get together and, and discuss what we want to achieve um, with the game. Like, what, what ultimately do we want the player experience to be? Because I think that... Um, at its, at its best, you make a game for the players. You don't make a game for yourself. Uh, it should be one you enjoy. It mm -hmm. should be one you're proud of at the end of the day. But um, when, you, when you think about, as a player, what should I be experiencing, it comes across better, and it helps you, it helps you contextualize the decisions you make. Um, for Inquisition, we had, the, we had the, uh, the double down difficulty of switching technology. We moved to the Frostbite 3 engine, which uh, at the time we received it was exceptionally good at water, explosions, smoke, tracer fire, Lots of tracer rounds and dragon. lighting. <laughs> it was not very good at save games, crafting, conversation, conversation <laughs> systems, handling a million words of dialogue. Yeah, like it, 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 it had it had challenges. So we had a bunch of work we had to do, kind of from the fundamentals to build the the thing, and we knew that was going to be the case. So um, it also had a, a huge opportunity, which was to take Dragon Age and make it more open, right? Because mm -hmm. it was a, it was an engine built so that guys could be fighting beside tanks and under jets that were dogfighting, right? Mm -hmm. So it could do big spaces in a way we could never do before. Um, and so we saw, obviously, you know, the success of Skyrim. You, you look at open world gaming and, and more, um, I guess, system-driven gaming, where it's like, hey, this is a thing you can go do, and it doesn't really require a story. And we saw a lot of appeal to, do, to bringing some of that back because it puts the onus back in the player's hands. So that was a, a factor for us, is how can we do that? But the other really important part to us was not to lose the Bioware, right? Not to, not to toss out storytelling and not to make narrative a, a third 
class citizen or anything like that. So what we, what we tend to do is we tend to try and find a statement that we feel encapsulates what we're trying to go for. And that can't be like, be a human elf dwarf or canary who is in charge of it. Like you, it, once it gets too detailed, you've lost it. So the one that we settled on, and again, it, it goes through, it goes through, like everything, it iterates and changes. Um, but it was, it was uh, immerse yourself in a vast world of companions, <coughs> choices, and consequence. Right. So those those are very important, right? Because obviously, immersing yourself means that we had we had an overall project goal of everything feeling like it was part of the whole. A vast world was was stating our goal of making sure that it was big, that it was that it was a, a, an enormous space, and I think we, we hit that. Um, and then companions being the first one of those C's is actually really important because that's something that we consider to be one of our strong suits is being able to tell stories not just that are plots but that actually are about people, right? So making sure that was the case, keeping choice, making sure there was difference in play based on what you chose to do, whether it be. Oh, I will level up this way, or I will side with the Templars, right? Those are both choices. They both have different consequences. And then con and consequence being that that choice has to pay off, right? That, that if you're going to make a choice, and Dave and I talked about this a little bunch of times, um, it, 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 we shouldn't offer the choice unless we have some way of varying the experience based on having done so. So that's, that's kind of where it comes from, is having a vision that, that allows you to go, what are the most important things to us so that if we do have to cut, we can we can say well it isn't it isn't vast or choice or consequence or character driven. Mm -hmm. That's an easier that's low hanging fruit. Let's um let's talk about those million words uh, because it just time. seems really <laughs> complicated and daunting. This task of man not not just the characters and the dialogue but the world building right mm -hmm. the lore the history the politics. How do you manage something so complicated? Like, like literally, what tools do you use? Is it, yeah, is it just spreadsheets? Do do <laughs> is, is it is there some is it a database? Is it what? what we how have does a wiki. We have a wiki now. We, we after the first two games, somewhere in the middle of the second game, where we started to realize that we're just not doing a very good job of, of <laughs> having all these documents. Because we, we, it is it mm -hmm. is so many documents. You produce them one at a time, and what happens over time is that uh, they start to get out of date. The fact that they get up to date really quickly. We will be making the game, and we're not even halfway done making the game, and just about every single design document we have online is out of date. Right. So we have a section where we, we had the idea, eventually we had to hire someone. His name is Ben Jelena. He's an editor that we hired, basically to just wrangle all our lore, to go through all our, all our pages we had, and, hmm. and then figuring out, okay, is this out of date? Is this out of date? And deleting that, putting and then organizing it so that we could access it properly. So yeah. tweet your questions to that guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, he, he, he would know, but even better than I, because, I mean, uh, I, I, I started the initial world, but I did not create all the lore. That was it was it was it was it's all agreed upon, but no single person could remember that much, especially not with my memory. So uh, it just so we, that we had uh, somebody that we could run things by, and he might not know personally, but he could always he could always fact check. And the editors are they're they're basically a, not not just our grammar checkers. They're our fact checkers. They're they're sort of our. Our, our gut checkers uh, right. when it comes to the, the overall story, we couldn't do it without them. I'm, I'm pretty sure without the editing team, we just collapse. Yeah. Like they, they are kind of like this connective tissue across mm -hmm. writing, going over to voiceover, to localizing the game, to put it in French or German or mm -hmm. Portuguese. Like they, they, they kind of are involved in every step of all of those processes. We, ha right? we have so much writing to do that uh, we, we just can't uh, uh, manage it all. Fact check, and then even like like he was saying, the the simple process of going through and preparing each line so that it enters the pipeline and gets recorded. Yeah, that's a process, an engine related process in and of itself. And I mean, we're writers. I mean, something goes wrong with a, any one of us. If something goes wrong with our computer, we just sort of paw it and say <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't work anymore. <laughs> Don't ask us to do really really technical things that it's just not going right. to happen. So um, yeah. it helps. So. Uh, a large part of it, to answer your question, is yep. is to have editors who can who can wrangle it in, and, and another one is is just to uh, um, to, to to make it piecemeal. To, to to it needs to be in digestible chunks for us, and we have writers that are sort of in charge of specific areas of the mm -hmm. lore, because for a long time I was Mr. Elf. I was the guy that, that people would come to if they had a question about anything elven, elven language, elven history, the Dalish. I, I knew everything that had anything to do with an elf. So um, I guess that would be more like a champion, I guess, of particular, sure. particular areas. Sure. And Freddie, what about from an actor's perspective? It seems like it would be a real technical challenge 
to be performing in, in this context where it's, it's got to be modular, there the, each line has to work like on its own and be recombined interactively, like what, what is that process like? Normally it would be difficult. I'm really, like I said, if you don't know by now, I'm really familiar with the, with the franchise. So for me, it's, it ain't shit, man. Like <laughs> I can do it in my sleep. Like I, and for free, you say. Well, I did. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, like, you know, you're basically doing three performances. When I did Vega, there was a lot more that we had in concept that made it to the game, right? Like we had this idea where you could come down and you could drink with, with, with Vega, right? But if you didn't come down and hang out too much, his response to you wouldn't be as positive. It would be a little less sort of like, hey man, you're, oh, you're gonna slum it with the grunts today? Nice. Um, so you have sort of three different performances that you're giving. You're, as the lead of the of the game is as Shepard's giving you a his paragon or his badass or his ambivalent sort of answer to you. So you're giving those performances as well. But as far as like the challenges, they, the, the challenges in voice work, you know, when I first got started and I wanted to be a, a stay at home dad and there's not much work in LA and, and voice work became an option. I was like, well, I'm a pretty good actor. I can handle this. And it was way more challenging than I thought. I didn't book shit for like the first three months. <laughs> and cause in acting, you know, if I'm uncomfortable with you, I can turn myself, I can fold my arms the way you know you are right now. I can kind of, you know what I mean? And you can know that I'm not, that I'm not wanting to be that close to you, but in a booth, I don't have that ability and, and it may not play. So you have to really sort of trick your brain to kind of not force the performance. Cause like those, you can tell when a guy in a video game who doesn't play video games <laughs> is forcing a, his character and literally will make me stop playing your game. I don't care how good it is. If the actor sucks, I just stop. Um, but uh, but as far as like approaching it, it is different. It is different tools in your brain. You kind of have to trick yourself, not to get off topic. But when I do, you know, Star Wars, I pretend I'm using the mind trick. You know what I mean? I, when I did Vega, this the this guy David, who was our sound engineer up at uh, they they went Technicolor? out of business now. Technicolor, Technicolor in Burbank. Um, he gave me this toy, this yellow toy gun, so I could hold it during all the banter stuff. So. I could feel more comfortable with it. And it just, the little tricks like that to make it more real for you. Otherwise, it really is just you and a microphone. It's very rare that you get the other actors in the booth with you. It's very rare that your director is face to face with you. Like I said, Caroline's in Edmonton, so we have a good relationship, but it's still, you know, earphone to mic, which isn't ideal. You want that that organic vibe. So anything you can do, they're not gonna give me, you know, a, a two-handed ax I can swing around. It'll be really cool, by the way. Um, we'll see. But well, yeah, maybe. But uh, but yeah. So I try to do things that, that make it real and and st and won't affect the sound quality of the mic. You know, there's a lot of times where you're really going at it, and they're like, "Hey, I can hear your pants moving," or "Can you take that change out of your pocket, Freddie?" Or you know what I mean, like little things like that. But as far as is it a challenge for me to do this kind of game? Hell no. Like nice. I play games all the time there's not a game i that i wouldn't be able to voice except i just i don't do that tough guy voice that you hear in all those games i'll just do my voice which is kind of goofy and doesn't sound cool and so <laughs> <laughs> so it, you know it, like with star wars I, you know kanan is very much more he's very serious and handles everything like this and the iron bolt clearly is much different than i am um and me i'm just sort of like hey so <laughs> so you know you make those types of changes but uh when you get character driven games, so much is laid out for you. And if you're familiar with the franchise and you know the enemies you're fighting and you know the types of weapons that you're using because you've actually used them, it, I, I would rather do that than, than she's all that any day of the week, man. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's more fun for me. It's more satisfying creatively. Uh, just incidentally, uh, when he says mentions Caroline, that's Caroline Livingston. She's right. the head of our, our voiceover department. She's the uh, truth. She's the one who makes it all come together. I don't, if, if you've played Bioware games, uh, I, I think that we do an excellent job of, of the voiceover. Yeah. I think perhaps, I, I'm not. I mean, I'm going to toot our own horn. I think we've got to do it probably better no, than Seth, any other game out there. Seth Green and I bow down to her often because she's just, she's worthy of respect. And, and Caroline is the one who pulls she, it all together. Yeah, man, yeah. she's a real solid director. We've all worked with her from Mass Effect to Dragon Age, and everybody loves her, man. And every voice actor I've worked with apparently has worked with her. I work with Steve Bloom a lot, who's done every voice for every game and cartoon <laughs> you've ever seen, and he knows her on a first name basis. And he would tell you the same thing about her, and he would tell you guys how lucky you are to have her. Oh yeah. Awesome. We know. Um, I want to ask about a particular uh, quality of the the texture of the, the world 
that is in Dragon Age Inquisition, in, 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 that it is very diverse, right? It's diverse racially and in terms of gender, um, kind of unlike this panel, which is for white dudes. Uh, it's actually, <laughs> hey, take it right? easy, I'm a Puerto Rican. Okay, there you go. <laughs> uh, but you know what I mean? Like it's, it's and, and I, I guess part of my, my question is, how much of that is a reflection of a kind of uh, real intention to express more contemporary values, you know, your own values, and, and make it more cosmopolitan and, and, and multicultural and, and more contemporary. And, and it seems like part of it also is just a reflection of the commitment to player choice and player agency. And then it kind of falls out of the, of the formal quality of, of having to respond to the fact that, that the players are creating their own characters, that you don't know it has to be modular, it has to be diverse. Uh, so so how, do, how do you guys think about that issue? Um. Uh, you mentioned it, it, you asked was it intentional, and I think it has to be intentional. Um, I mean, the majority of the people who work at Bioware are really any video game, they're, they're all going to be white men. Uh, so if, you, if we just sort of did it things without really considering it, we would just make a game that completely reflected ourselves. But we have a larger player base. We have people of all ethnicities, uh, both genders, all, all genders, I'll say, uh, who are also part of our audience. And it's, and it's not that they you know, we need to do this in order for them to play. They already play, but there are more people out there and, and who would be willing to play our game, and I think it's incumbent upon us to intentionally uh, have our game reflect the people we, we want to invite to play our game. And you have to remember, video games have been doing this for a long time, even before Bioware. Like, you can go all the way back to EverQuest and find the Erudites and the <laughs> Wood Elves and and whatever other, I can't, I was a wood elf. I can't remember the other races there. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, like if you go to, in, in Hollywood, if you go on an audition and it says, you know, minority, you see every minority there. Like they're not writing a character for a black dude or for an Indian dude or for a Chinese dude. It's just like, yeah, whatever. As long as we get a minority and fill the quota, nobody will complain. Hmm. And that's how Hollywood really is. And games have always been braver than that. Like if, if TV has a gay character, they're like, we have a gay character and we're going to put it in entertainment news so everybody knows we're cool with it. Like video games don't do that. They go, yeah, he's gay. That's it. That's so it. Or he's asexual. You yeah. know what I mean? Or he doesn't care. Like it's not, it's, they do it intentionally, but they treat it with the proper respect. Whereas the, the business that, that I came from really doesn't, it, it never did. Like if you were, if you're Latino, you're going to play a drug dealer a lot. If you're black, you're going to play a drug dealer a lot in Hollywood. That's just the way it goes. It, it's just the way it goes. If you're Indian, you're going to be working in the convenience store that a black guy or a Latino guy is robbing. Like, that's just the way Hollywood works. And video games refuse to do that. You know what I mean? They really do put forth a, a concerted effort of courage to actually do that and know that society won't freak out the way Hollywood yeah. thinks they will. And but, you don't, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like everybody plays, everybody loves it, and it works. But, but let's say, but Bioware does it more, I think, than, than a lot of video I would games, say they do, right? but they, they they're just, more they weren't the that. first. I just, yeah. you know, yeah, and I'm not true. trying to say sure. you yeah. guys weren't the first, ha, ha, ha. Oh, no. But <laughs> they, games have had bravery to do that where I don't yeah. think my business always yeah. has. And, and I think um, one thing that, that we do, we do very consciously, and we have for, for years, is um, we're actively trying to broaden our internal horizons. Like Dave says, you know, it could be a bunch of white guys. Yes, could be. We struggle against that wherever possible. I think that perspective is probably the most important thing. I mean, we're building fantastical alien races or fantastical fantasy races. Um, there is no need to have a singular perspective on that. You want to be able to get as broad a perspective, as broad a voice as possible. And I mean, you know, uh, thankfully, half our writing team is female. Right, so we have, we have a bunch of lady writers, and they're they're awesome at their job. Applaud yourself! Applaud yourself! Yeah, and, 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 and you know, and again, I mean, I go to a lot of PAXs, and I come to things like this, and it's like it's nice to see there's a mix of gender and 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 race is something that the whole industry has to work on. And I, you know, I've I've met anyone who wants that to no, 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 let's keep it a white guy. That's stupid. <laughs> it's the most ridiculous thing because again, perspective is really important, and everybody's kind of walked their path, and they've got something to bring creatively. Uh, they've got something to bring technically, maybe just a, a solution to a problem. Mm -hmm. um, and when we look at how we approach it from a, from a, the, the, the nice thing about something like fantasy or sci-fi, we're not doing like kind of modern military or anything like that, is that, you know, we can, we can explore themes of like racism and, and, you know, sexuality and that kind of thing, which, which can be, you know, real hot button issues for a lot of people. The nice thing is we can do that slightly through the lens of, oh no, this, these people are pointed ears, right? They, they're actually a different race. 
and yet they are people, right? And, and we keep that very conscious in mind. And so we, we can sort of explore some of those themes and at the same time do it in a way that I hope maybe, maybe just sidestep some of the baggage and lets people get underneath it. And it's, you know, it, it's, we struggle with it. It's tough because you always feel like you're maybe, maybe fucking this one up. Um, and at the same time, it's worth the effort. It's worth trying, yeah. right? Uh, and um, all I need is, is a few people to come up to me and say, thank you, I saw myself in that character or I saw just something I really needed to hear that moment. And, and that kind of makes it worth it to yes. me. Anyway. You gotta have people coming up and saying that because you gotta, it, it's so prevalent in the games and there is no race or, or sex boundaries. Yeah. It, if, if no one has, thank you. <laughs> I would say, I just want to add on sure. that, that while it has to be intentional, it's not actually that difficult. Yeah. I mean, it, it does take an effort, but thank it doesn't you. take yeah. that <laughs> much. Nice. I mean, there's, there are people who, who object to it. You mm -hmm. know, there's, there's a, there's a, there are people out there that don't want us to do that, and they will say, oh, you, you make it like a, like a laughter school special, like it, that's, as if in order to deal with this one aspect, it has to take our entire focus. We can't do anything else but all day, but think about how we're going to, you know, uh, uh, put social justice into our games. When really, <laughs> it just takes some time, a bit of time, that you stop and say, "Is this okay? Mm -hmm. yeah. What, what, what is it? Would it, be, would it change anything about this character if, if he were female mm -hmm. or black?" Right. Like, and for the record, movie. I was in the very last after school special. It was <laughs> exactly. like, really? really? Yeah, it was called Too Soon for Jeff, and I think the Richard Bay show took over. <laughs> well, what was the topic? What was Too Soon? Yeah, I don't Sex, know. Sex, drugs? He, he was pregnant with, he was going to be a father at 15 and didn't want wow. to know. Oh, that is too soon. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, there's some rules you love, there's others you're like, what did I do? <laughs> All right, so earlier we were talking, um, and we, we were talking about uh, like tabletop role playing, right? Mm -hmm. Freddie, you said that you would played back in the day you had cyberpunk. cyberpunk yeah I was a big um, cyberpunk talk about guy. Dungeons and Dragons yeah. so obviously I mean it's it's interesting to me to to, to constantly um, be reminded of how important and influential those that game was yeah. Dungeons and Dragons you know tabletop role playing this kind of mix that it shouldn't work right this mix of <laughs> improvisational theater and like number crunching strategy uh, wargaming, basically. Yeah, yeah. And yet here we are, and we're still seeing that same mix, right? Those mm -hmm. different ingredients. So I guess I want to hear a little bit about the, the influence of, of kind of, you know, old school uh, role playing on, on the design and creation of this game. And, and then, yeah, just, just, you know, hear about whether that's still something you guys struggle with creating that balance, or, or where are we with that? All right. So one of, one of my goals when kind of putting together some of the ideas behind Inquisition was that um, the players should be able to kind of play the way they want to, right, and still enjoy it. Um, and a part of that comes, I mean, Dave's, Dave's got, and Freddie as well, we've, we've all got kind of this pen and paper history. And the thing about pen and paper games is that based on it, partly who your GM is and partly who's playing is that the games take on different colors and calibers, mm -hmm. right? So I've played games with guys who are like, yeah, I talked to the guy, but anyway, let's start rolling initiative, right? Mm -hmm. Like they don't <laughs> want to role play, they kind of want to roll. Mm -hmm. Play with dice, <laughs> um, and uh, and then then you have other people who like are like no 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 we'll be doing no fighting tonight it's intricate story time and everybody like, hey. I hate the fighting business right it's like freshman year of high yeah. school right? yeah it, it's like it's like well I'll get my cloak right and then away you go um, so the the difference the difference between those two is that again those the, they're they're playing the same game and the games the tabletop games are flexible enough that you can kind of do either and 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 quite successfully the rules are there for both sets and so um when i was looking at like okay so how do we take dragon age big and be open because the biggest danger for us was losing our focus and not being a story game or not you know having a coherency to the experience and so what we tried to do and i worked with had to work with a whole bunch of different groups was to try and contextualize all the different systems we were building so that the player could still progress in the heart of the game via almost any means. And that was that was my best goal. And I think that games that have always kind of captured my imagination are the ones that do this. So the example I used when I first pitched this idea, I was talking about like, let's do gameplay that's activity driven was Sid Meier's Pirates. And that's that's a classic. That's right? a great yeah. game. Uh, and it's been released. What sword did you choose of the three? Oh, oh I was always a rapier. Yes! Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, Sorry, we had a nerd moment. Fred, Freddie and I are discovering we have a lot in common. Anyway, the exact so, same age. Uh, yeah, we are. Uh, so, He's handled it better. Uh, <laughs> but here's, here's the best part. So anyway, so in Zimmer's Pirates, virtually everything you did was piratey, 
right? And that was a huge <laughs> influence. Like, so I'm going to go dancing. Why would I go dancing? Well, I'm going to get the hand of a governor whose daughter will help me get more land so that I can secure my fortunes as a pirate king. Okay, cool, why would I do that? Well, partly because it contributes to success, but also by doing all the things you do when you meet the governor's daughter, she whispers secrets in your ear and tells you where there's Spanish galleons. She tells you where you can go find information. She tells you where your missing family that were kidnapped by the evil Baron Ramondo <laughs> are. All of, so, so suddenly, it's, it's a dating sim, sorta, but it's also a treasure hunting sim, and a seven cities of gold sim, and a missing family, and you're like, wait, hold on, those are all related. And when you go find your family, they tell you information about stuff they overheard, and you're like, wait, all of these things link back together. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to try and see what we could do in a fantasy context to do that. And so that's where the idea of, of power came in, and the idea that, that certain things you did earned you power, and power was the Inquisition's currency of being able to advance the story. That was really the core idea. So by the time we finished, kind of like, and that took about three years of tumbling to get all the rough edges off, and, and there's still a few. Um, but like when you recruit a new character, lots of very story-driven activity, right? Hey, Iron Bulls, join my party. I get power for that because this band of mercenaries came and joined the Inquisition, and he's my personal bodyguard. Cool. That's power, right? That makes perfect sense in the context of the game. Um, I go and close a Fade Rift. Well, I'm the only one who can do that, and I work for the Inquisition, so they must be cool. Power, right? People owe us favors as a result of that. I secure new camps. Well, now I have forces in more positions. They're presumably feeding information back to my spy master. They, I, I can deploy forces more quickly because I've got a front, you know? Boom. Power. All of these things, and what we did was try to contextualize every single thing we did in either I'm making the Inquisition stronger or I'm pushing back those who stand against the Inquisition. And by doing so, um, I think we created a thing where I can gain power by going out and killing a dragon and then bull drinks with me, or I can gain power by collecting enough materials that I'm building tents so that my men are safe and better rested and better equipped and so on. Those are very different activities. One is walk up to things and click and exploration based and, and part of a, a, you know, keeping a mid-range goal. The other is win this encounter, right? And that's a, that's a purely combat driven activity, which again, if you've crafted right stuff, it's easier. If you've brought the right characters, it's easier. If you pick the right powers, it's easier. So again, those systems start to interrelate just like Sid Meier's Pirates. So that for us was looking at old school pen and paper where it's like the game can change based on the player because they give you a venue to be social, to be schemey, to be the guy who just punches things in the face and the game adapts to how you want to play. Could we do that? And that's, that's where I landed. Nice. Um, do you guys play games at Bioware? Or do you, is that part of the culture? You sit around as a, any, uh, any favorites currently in the studio that... I'll, I'll let you guys go, I just talked forever. So. Yeah. <laughs> You mean like at home or? No, or just in, in, as part of studio culture. At like, work he works. Yeah. He does not play games. He works. <laughs> I play games at home. Yeah. I guess technically, I guess it's sort of for work. So, yeah. I what's guess. a current? What's a current favorite? Uh, I'm playing Crusader Kings Two. Oh, okay. You're yeah. always playing. I'm Crusader always playing. You're Crusader always. Kings. Kings. <laughs> uh, it's just. I, I enjoy RPGs, but I, I find that I, I don't, they don't make me relax anymore because mm -hmm. I'll play I'll, I'll, I'll play them. Mm -hmm. They'll come out, I'll play them intensely, and but I analyze them. I can't. I cannot. That's like, that's like taking my wife to the movies. She's been in the business so long. She's like, so that was a mistake there. Boy. I'm like, man, would you exactly. shut up, please? And I have to do it. Nobody knew who Kaiser Soze was. Shut up. <laughs> For real. Uh, but but yeah, I'll do it and I'll get it over with. Whereas the the games that I play. Um, that that I that I will enjoy, I think the most are the ones that are a little bit removed that still have a story, but tell tell the story in different ways. And Crusader Kings Two is just a game that I love, just because it has a it's strategic and story based. That, that it has an emergent personal story that it, that it brings out through the strategy. And I mean uh, that that's a, a lot of different games do that I, I like do that and sort mm -hmm. of trying to think about story that isn't told through direct narrative. Mm -hmm. That uh, about the, the story that the player forms in their head, sort of emergent narrative, uh, and and how games can do that in different ways. It's, yeah. it's a good exercise to engage in. Nice. I'm, I'm kind of like Dave. The ones that are, that really sync with me. Um, I mean, I love RPGs for sure. Uh, but ones that are RPG adjacent, hmm. that like share a lot of similarities with us. But they, it's kind of like it's kind of like holding up a thing and then turning it on its edge. It's mm -hmm. like, oh, that's that's kind of cool. So, uh, be it a progression system in a shooter or um, things things I've really kind of been digging into, uh, like games like Starbound or Minecraft, stuff like that, where there's there's kind of elements of progression and a lot of freeform gameplay. But they're they're definitely not RPGs. But you can see kind of where they touch, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
And those to me are incredibly, incredibly compelling. Um, as well, other like takes on the RPG that aren't kind of like ours. Um, so one that I, I is an eternal favorite is the Dark Souls series. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. They are they are they're they're, 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 they're fucking spectacular. <laughs> <laughs> they are they are the most brutally fair gameplay experiences you will ever have because because there is always a way to beat it. There is always a way to learn and get better. The mm -hmm. game teaches you by punishing you. It's kind of like a dominatrix. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and and. <laughs> oh, 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 hey. um, so, so, so that's the thing, is it right? It hurts you, so you get better. But anyway, um, <laughs> drill sergeant, I don't know, whatever. But the thing is, like games like that, because again, it's in the RPG space. There's stats, there's progression, there's gear, but it doesn't do the same kind of story choice based stuff. But yeah. I still feel like that experience is very much mine because I went to do the Tower of Flame before I went to the to the giant, right? And I'm like, oh cool, I, I tackle boss in a different way, I learned different things, I found different gear, and all of those create an experience for me that that um, is is just so compelling because it almost challenges you to like, what else could you do? What else could you do? What if you did it with uh, just punching, right? Mm -hmm. and, and it's possible. Yep. So um, I, I love games that kind of explore around the space that we live in. Awesome. Um, what are you playing now, Freddie? Other than Dragon Age. Um, well, that's what I've really been playing <laughs> yeah. a lot. I was, I'm a big Grand Theft Auto head. Nice. Um, I'm the guy that, that is in the parachute targeting you from above that you see the dot on the map and you don't know why you can't see me and I keep killing you. It's because I'm ahead of I'm above you. <laughs> um, so I, I used to play that a lot, but I've been playing a lot of Dragon Age. I, uh, I like a lot of the... Uh, I'm trying to remember what they're calling it, like the turret-based games where you have to like build different like tower defense. Tower defense, yeah. Tower defense, defense, yeah. Yeah. Tower nice. defense games. So I I played a lot of those. Nice. Um, but Grand Theft Auto was something like the Red Dead Redemption. Those Beautiful. those titles yeah. always were very empowering to me, and I always had a natural ability to be good in the multiplayer's in those. I mm -hmm. play Call of Duty like everyone else. I played Destiny for a little while, mm -hmm. but I'm not as much a a lewd whore as, as, mm -hmm. as that game needs you to be to right. really be addicted to it. I played Warcraft for seven years. I mean, that was like a, like a soul sucker. For healer. Me. I was a dwarven yeah. healer. I had the fear ward. If I was Metaxa and you were in my guild, hello. Um, I'll give up my name now. It's okay. I don't play anymore. Um, but uh, yeah, I was in a guild with like all actors. It was like me, it was Macaulay Culkin. It was, uh, Shannon Doherty, who was better than all of us, the, by the, the way. Screen actors uh, yes, <laughs> we were the screen actors. Yes, we were the screen actors. And uh, yeah, man, I played that forever, but I literally, as a dwarven priest, it was like having a real job <laughs> that you hated going to. <laughs> yeah. And at four o'clock, your phone would start blowing up, and it's like, hey, we're raiding Arcatraz at seven. Why aren't you here? And it's like, dude, I'm trying to have sex with my wife. <laughs> <laughs> I can't help you out. You, you know what I mean? Like, Shannon was single. She was fine. You know what I mean? Mac was dating Mila. They were good. Like, everything was cool then. I was the one with free time. So yeah. I, I played a lot of Warcraft before that. I was an EverQuest head, um, so I was a big role player guy. Um, I, you know, I was keyed for Vexthal. You weren't, so suck it. Oh, wow. um, we ran that wow. zone, man. Like we ran it. Guys would come to try to get it, and we would tag the mob before they could get it. We had this monk who could feign death and pull a guy across an entire zone. It was amazing. Nice. Um, so there was a trip down Nerd Lane for you guys. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, man, I like a lot of the old school arcade games. I was telling them my uh, I did this crappy baseball movie back in the day and rented this house uh, by the beach and I filled it with arcade games from this arcade uh, and you could rent them for like, it was like a hundred bucks a month or something and that's so why I was like, well how many games do you have? And uh, Donkey Kong Jr. was one of them and so I played Donkey Kong Jr. till the joystick was almost broke and I loved that game. So the old school, nice. I still get off on. I play Zelda, the original Zelda probably once a year just to just to play it again and, and in honor of, uh, of my man Robin who's, who's no longer with us, that was his favorite game ever. Um, and my man Kieran Culkin's favorite game ever too. So we kind of play once a year, just out of out of respect for that great title. I know Ocarina Time's better, but the original Zelda has just got a special place in my heart. So I play that like once a year. And to me, you know, every boss should be Bowser. It should be hard. It should be difficult. That's why I hated Force Unleashed 2 so much because you could fight Vader and take no damage. And I know I work for Lucas Films now, and I'm not supposed to say that, but that game blows. Like, <laughs> if, if I if Vader can't hurt you 
you failed epically. That game wow. pissed me off so much, wow. man. Um, and it's not till the end that you realize, oh, you screwed me over. But um, but yeah, so I played. You know, I try to grab everything that comes out that looks good. You know, I played Wolfenstein. I, I like that. I thought they mixed up their end bosses. I thought that should have been inverted because hmm. the last fight was just too simple, and the fight before that had a couple more challenges to it. Um, but I try to get I try to get my hands on everything. I played a little Assassin's Creed. I didn't finish it, but it, the pirate one because of Sid Meier's kept my mm -hmm. interest for a while. Um, so I try to get my hands on just about just about whatever's out there. Great. Um, why don't we open it up to questions from the crowd? So uh, maybe we'll start here. Um, so Frank actually stole my question about the diversity issue, but so I want to turn it into a thank you actually, especially for the representation of, of queer characters and. and especially for the Iron Bull scene that everybody's been so excited about online <laughs> recently. Um, but I guess that my question is going to be a little bit about designing the um, designing the different party members that you get. Like, how do you, like, one of the things about the Dragon Age games, I think, is that each of the characters are so different. Like, I don't feel like anybody is overlapping in any way. So how do you go about doing that? Do you sit down and go, okay, maybe we had somebody a little bit too much like that? Like, how do you, how do you design these characters and flesh them out? Well, um, I'll, I'll throw I'll throw kind of at a high level uh, the, the high level goals and Dave can talk to the specifics how we do this is um, that what we what we want are characters that are characters first right and they don't they shouldn't serve a role in the game like this is the warrior who is straight like fuck that no I want I want I want someone with an intriguing history and and, and that kind of thing so we start with character rather than starting with stats or starting with with uh, uh, splits um, and the 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 big thing we do to make them feel different and make sure that they're different is that we make sure that, um, and we do more character concepts than see the light of day, for sure, but the ones that survive are ones that basically have anti in, right? They have stakes in what's happening in the yeah. game. So if you, uh, a, a, so if we had a, 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 a mage who, you know, was just kind of like whatever about the circles and I don't really care about the chantry. <laughs> Well then, why are you here, right? <laughs> exactly. Why would you join the Inquisition in, in part, but also why are you part of this game, right? Whereas Vivian has absolutely firm views, and they conflict with Solus's, right? And that 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 makes them suddenly those two are excellent characters because they're opposite poles. She gets mad at me all the time, yeah, exactly. man. And I try to. I'm telling you, I love Vivian. I wanted to romance her character, and I just it's wrong. man, I made her mad so much. I was like, I'm going with Sarah. This is. Really <laughs> It's tough, man. But to go to what you're yeah. saying, all those characters, and I, I can speak on this as an actor, it's all about motivation, right? They're all working towards the same goal, but they all have different motives on how they want to get there. And it's the games when everybody's like, that guy sucked, and it's because of A, B, and C that you're kind of like, okay, I'll finish the game, but whatever. It's it's better when it's that guy sucks, and it's A, B, and C, and someone else goes, yeah, but it's also D, E, and F, and this guy likes X, Y, Z, and... You know what I mean? It's just different motivation. That's what makes it a character-driven game. That's what these guys do so great. There's some smoke blowing at you, but is it true? <laughs> is it true? Um, um, sorry. Go. Go for it. Oh, uh, I, I was just going to say, uh, other than the obvious things, I, I guess the, the thing that people probably don't know is that it's very collaborative. Um, it's not just the writers. I mean, a, a writer could go and we write, think of this fantastic story for this character, right? Like, you know, I, you know, 10 tons of fan fiction about it and then <laughs> hope that everybody loves the character enough to make it make them in the game. But it's 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 a slower process than that. We, we come up with sort of uh, ideas that grab it. Because it has to be, it has, I encourage my writers to come up with ideas of things they want to write. I mean, uh, somebody out in the audience, you know, we get ideas, people, people saying, why did you write a character like this? And Sometimes at the end of the day, it's because nobody wanted to. We had, it has to grab us first, yes. And but it's like we'll, we'll sort of do these these sort of brief ideas. We we throw them to the concept artists, for instance, and they come back with some, you know, things that grab them, and they'll do these pictures. And sometimes you'll see a concept for a character, and you're like, even one that's you sort of, ah, I don't know if that's really interesting, and it'll come back with a picture, and suddenly it's like, boom. Vivian, I think was that. Vivian was exactly that. Yeah. Well, those are the boots. Yeah. The first, the first concepts we got back for her, she was white and blonde and and and, and an ice queen and stuff. But she looked like Alex. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah a little bit, but <laughs> but an ice queen version of Alex. And, right. And that was sort of ice queen was kind of her initial concept, and it didn't really grab us. And then one day, I forget who it was, maybe Matt. Yeah. Matt Rhodes. 
I did a version of her where he, he made her black, and I, I'd say that's the one, and, and just and uh, super imperious stylish. and yeah, super yeah, stylish, yeah, yeah, yeah. like, like had, that's where he had, had sort of the Maleficent version, and he came, brought that back and said, what about this? And she then, talks to you about your fashion. Yeah. Like, that's yeah. how much, yeah. that, uh, and, the, well, and so that's why that. she didn't until, like, we got this concert where, that's like, this, cool. is, this outfit like, is, is a woman who, oh my god, she Mary is aware Kirby, of every part of her. Mary appearance. Kirby was like, as soon as she saw that picture, I think she was like, I want to write this character. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, there's a, a period of that, and it, there's a lot of back and forth even after that fact, because we're, you know, in order to make them fit, we'll talk, we'll, we'll be starting to write a character, we'll say, well, these characters overlap too much, so I'll get the writers together and we'll discuss it, and sometimes it means that character is now cut. Somebody cr goes up in the bathroom and cries for a while, and, <laughs> uh, but it's just a matter of us, us talking it out as a group, we're writing this all together, but it's not just the writers. It's it's people like like Mike. It's it's the artists. It's, it's sometimes it'll be a programmer who comes into the room and and says, "I have an idea," have an, and, and talks to me about it. And I'll be like, "That idea sucks," <laughs> <laughs> but that one piece of what you said is a really neat kernel of an idea. And suddenly later it'll blow blow up into an entire plot of its own. That's and that's happens. something important to remember in, in in all forms of art. Like sometimes you may think an idea sucks, pitch it because there yeah. may be one part in there that inspires someone else that then inspires you and all of a sudden you guys have exactly what you thought you had in the first place but didn't so always what yeah. he just said is super important in, in screenwriting video games whatever it is you want to do that's so important so, so, so unless important. unless it's that campaign you ran as a dm <laughs> <laughs> or that character you ran in that campaign and you want to come ago. and tell me all about it <laughs> <laughs> So Wait, let me just break that? it to you. It's it's not it's telling other people about your D and D campaign is never interesting. <laughs> so you're gonna sit on the opposite end of the table at dinner yeah. for me tonight. Perfect. Perfect. Patrick uh, uh, Patrick Weeks has a uh, last thing, just a piece of advice. Patrick Weeks has a mantra he uses for that, mm -hmm. which is Patrick hey, Weeks wrote everything. I I said, yeah, by the way. yeah, awesome. bowl solace. Hey, anyway, a bunch of characters. He's, he's awesome. Anyway, so Patrick will say, this is not a good idea, and I know that. But it might get us to one. <laughs> and don't don't be afraid to use that. That's actually really powerful. It's like I don't have any ego in this. I know this is dumb, but combat ballerinas. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you could probably make that work if you if you if you Rambo and Dega. Yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> he'll he'll do that. He'll, and it's a, it's a, you encourage people to talk, and he'll say combat ballerinas, and I'll be I'll be in the middle of a meeting, and I'll stop, and I'll be like. Oh, it's another one of these. <laughs> <laughs> but it breaks but, the ice. It but it, ice. It, it gets us talking. And like by the time we're finished, it's neither combat nor ballerinas. But you know, so, you know, we went through like Sailor Moon and down <laughs> into you know that dirty movie we watched on the weekend, and, and then boom, suddenly we're 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 at the edge, and and somebody will finally throw out something, and it's like the the, the quiet writer in the back of the room, Brienne. She, she sometimes will just throw something out, and we'll all stop and. She thought it was an. She thought it was stupid. She was like joking, and, and everybody will stop and realize you have that moment, that 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 creative moment of lightning striking, where you're like, that might actually work, and you sort of got to pose the question of the room, and everybody's like, eh, and that's that's how it happens. Okay, now we stop. Awesome. <laughs> um, I want to I want to hear from someone See? in the back. <laughs> so in the striped shirt. Sure. One question. Yes. Uh, So just to repeat it for the mic, how do you balance between world building a world that's the right scale and focusing on the characters, on the intimate character stuff? That's kind well, of my entire job. <laughs> <laughs> First, you acquire one David Gator, and uh, so one of the one of the big things we do is is um, so when it, here's the thing is no one no one it's like Star Trek no one likes lore. Um, He's kind of a dick, but the, the, the big thing is that uh, you know there's one Star Trek fan. Uh, 
It was Data's brother. Anyway, so uh, the um, the thing about the thing about lore is that in and of itself, it's it's not there, and you certainly can't count on players to engage with it, right? So there's a codex entry, and like Freddie might read it, I would read it, but not everybody's going to, and you can't rely on people doing so. So, but you can put a lot of texture there, right? A lot of like deepening lore and and kind of like oh, if you want to, it's accessible. It's like you know going into the Lord of the Rings wiki wiki and kind of like losing yourself. Oh, Baron Dur is built by the by the by the Numenorians. I didn't know that. You know, you can do that kind of thing. But more importantly, um, what you need to do is have an arc that, that in and of itself has a clear objective, right? Has a clear purpose for the player to achieve. Because if you have a player who isn't like into the story and doesn't understand like the, the deep kind of meaningful blah, blah, blah of the politics, if you can say, but go there and punch that guy in the face... And, and then ideally give them a couple of different ways to go there or any number of systems that allow them to go there, then, then players who aren't engaging on the lore level can still engage with the gameplay. Right, and that becomes very important. And what happens, you, we find this very organically. And if you read s certain reviews of like Dragon Age, people are like, yeah, I didn't really know what was going on, and I think that maybe that was bad, but anyway, 10 hours in, I couldn't stop playing. And that's part of the process of saying, I knew what to do, and even though I maybe wasn't engaged with the world or was a new player, it was clear enough to proceed. And over time, you start to absorb the world into your awareness because we try to write consistently. Where lore becomes important then is that the writing team or your design team or whoever you have that's touching it in any way has to know it very well and inside and out because it's the glue that silently holds together, you know, the, 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 the nucleus and the electrons, right? It's the thing that, that, that keeps you, um, keeps your world coherent and self kind of consistent. Because if you start breaking your own rules, then it falls apart. If you, if it happens a lot, you'll play a game, and uh, they've only designed the the world that they need immediately, and you very quickly get a sense that outside of that immediate, immediate <laughs> area, there is no world. And it, it, I think it just happens. Like the 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 writers, the the game makers need to know it. And even if they don't always bring it up, they'll be like that little offhand reference. I'm not going to say the name of the game I want to say right now, but I really want to say it. <laughs> I'm not. That's probably best. It's best. It's best. I don't want to hurt feelings. Um, yeah, another one from the back. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so what, how do you balance the roles between creative director and writer at BioWare? What's the process? Um, well, first off, Dave's a much better writer than I am. <laughs> he really is. He really is. Uh, I started as a writer, so I come from that background, but I recognize like, like guys like Dave and Patrick and Luke and the writing team, again, they're, they're, they're hands-on with it. They're working with it right now, and, and Dave's got a, a verb and a turn of phrase. That means that I, I recognize that if I were writing the crit path, I think it would actually be, that would damage it. What I try to do, and this is really where our role center balance mine tends to be trying to harmonize all the parts, right? So I will go wander over to the lead encounter designer and say, I really need this one to sell this emotion because the writers are building towards this and the cinematic leading into your encounter is selling this. And I'd like you to work with me to help take that idea and that arc home because we're then going to run into the finale of this particular story arc. Right, and I need that to accomplish X, Y, or Z. Right, so um, from his point of view, it might be, oh, I need an endless wave, and it's a survival kind of horde thing. So I feel like it's a desperate holdout against blah blah blah. But what that does is part of a, a larger harmonic kind of experience that ideally is supported by loot that's like, oh, loot that actually is hand placed to be like, oh burnt teddy bear and you're like wow I actually feel bad about opening that chest and you know all these all these different elements and trying to make sure they all kind of work together and that, that you feel like the progression and everything is all part of one experience and that's that's how I approach my role is that it's uh, I tend to look as one big narrative but it's a narrative of play as opposed to a narrative of story and it frees me up that, that my only concern is story I mean I don't always get my way but it's I'm the one who's going to go to Mike and and and, and you know, champion the needs of the story versus the rest of the project. He has to keep the larger picture in the mind. So he's he's providing me guidance. He, he a lot of times it's 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 the like the when we talked about how the games begin, the the notes like okay, Dave, uh, we we want a lot of exploration in this story, so you're going to have to figure out how to put together a narrative that is is not 
uh, uh, story driven, that it's exploration driven, that yeah. we've never done before. Okay, that challenge one. And he'll, he'll, he'll give me a few things that maybe he wants to see, and that provides me the box in which I have to work. And then I go to the rest of my team, and my role to, to my team is to uh, get them to the point where they feel ownership over what they're writing. I, I, I support them, and when they have needs, I'm the one who has to go out and champion them, that what they need to the rest of the team, because they're just they're just uh, a writer. They 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 don't have the voice of like me or or Mike. So yeah. we are the story warriors, <laughs> I guess. Um, and how about right here, right up front? So something I absolutely love, but also drives me completely crazy about Bioware games, mm -hmm. is certain like game shattering changes, you know, choices that are hidden so far you know, in the decision trees, that a lot of players will never get to them. You know, just two quick examples. Like in Mass Effect 2, if you don't do Tally's loyalty mission, mm -hmm. and you know, a romancer, then in Mass Effect 3 you can't make peace between the Geth and her people. Mm -hmm. And like, I kept like, you know, she kept jumping off the cliff, and I'm like, what's going on? Like, why won't you listen to me? <laughs> and then, you know, you know, Dragon Age Origins, something I didn't find out until, you know, I went through Dragon Age Keep. Right. If you're, you know, a male dwarf, you can have, you know, a ma like a noble child with a dwarf before like Orzammar. Like, how does how do I as a player like get at those choices without playing the game like literally a hundred times? It, dep it depends. If you're what you're trying to do is reverse engineer an end result. It's, you're it's my like, you're my cousin with choose your own adventure books. <laughs> he literally reads every single page and then decides the story that he wants to do. It's <laughs> <laughs> awesome, not, by the way. It's not a, not necessarily a bad way to play. Yep. And, and there are different people play with. For, with different reason, things in mind for different reasons. One, Dude, one I save before someone, every judgment, and if I <laughs> screw up, I start over. <laughs> so, so some play people, you play. some people talk to followers, trying to think about how to get them to higher approval, or or how do I get to the romance? But and then the other one is is I'm just going to play my character and give the responses that that they would give. That's the version that we write from, and uh, the the minority content, the the idea that. There is content which not every player is going to see. We, we do that on purpose. Now it may annoy some people, it's true, but I think there's also a, a matter of, of the discovery as well. When you discover that, 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 that hey, there's this whole part of the game that maybe I didn't see or this choice I didn't take that maybe have given me something else. There, it could annoy someone, but it could also be, be an element of, 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 oh, you know, like, because we're trying to, to, to have consequence for choices. So yeah. cho pl choosing to play a dwarf gives you the opportunity to have this child, which maybe you wouldn't have encountered, but then your friend, you know, on online or whatever, or you're meeting at the water cooler, and then say, he says, yeah, yeah, I had, I had a child. And you're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's on purpose. That's on purpose. Because if, the player, if a player could go through and they could, they could hit 100% of the content, then they're done. Right, and, and, and we want to, it, it, there's an element of replayability, there's an element of, of feeling like your choice have consequence, even though it is an artful illusion in many ways, that that's, that's the only way we can provide it. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's so interesting to think about this tension between gameplay and story in terms of um, a desire for mastery. Like when, when I play a game, uh, I want to know every nuance of the strategic and tactical space. Like I want to drill down and, and explore every detail uh, but moving through a story is about these mutual exclusive choices. It's about uh, happenstance and and uh, and kind of discovery and surprise, and not about like mastering every detail of the space. And yet, um, I think there are there are elements of both in each. You know what I mean? And, and I think there are different kinds of players who who kind of like weave those together in different ways. Well, and one approach we use is that we don't. Um and I think we, we try to avoid the sense that there is a best ending. Mm. Um, Inquisition, I think, does a very good job of, of sidestepping which is the right decision, which is the best decision, because um, I think it engages you as a player to go, well, I think what I did was right, and then, and then ideally you get to talk to someone who totally disagrees. <laughs> um, because then you end up in a place where you're like, oh, wow, we, we came at that from completely different angles. Um, and Inquisition, I mean, so there's, there's one in Origins where you know, there actually is a best way to resolve the Redcliffe mm. dilemma with with a kid who's been possessed by a demon. There is a way to resolve that, and there is a best way to do it. Um, and I actually see that as kind of a weak spot of that yeah. plot, because it's like, well, then, then the other options are bad. And I think yeah. that it tends to be like, no, this is the option that's best for me. 
it, it, it leads to a much better way. It's sort of like, you know, should I play a mage or a rogue? Well, what do you like doing? Do you like blowing dudes up from a distance or stabbing them? <laughs> Both are good, but, but they're very different experiences and they are exclusive. Yeah. They're just Both not. Both are good. Yeah, yeah, they're just exclusive um, in the storyline. Yeah. I think we have uh, time for a couple more, so I'm going to uh, go to the middle. And yes, how about, yes, yes, you in the. Okay. Yes. Hi. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask about the different love interests in the game and how <laughs> much of it is something that kind of naturally comes out of writing them or how much is a good thing you want to hit a certain target audience or whatever. And were there ever times where you had to say to a writer, like, look, we need this kind of love interest? Like, could you write this as a love interest now? Like, you know, like, what is the process? Uh, the so, love so interest process. The love yeah. interest process. <laughs> well, so going back to my right. earlier point, we do start with them as characters first. We mm. never say, we're going to need a straight male. Uh, <laughs> we, we, we instead build up a cast of characters who, again, how do they react to the story, right? And how are they involved? So, so we have characters first, right? rather than we have love interest first. Because I think with love interest first, it becomes like you're in this weird space where you're trying to like fill all the boxes. And then your character Fabio's like, yeah. on the cover of your yeah game. yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> uh, and, and yes yeah contrary to Patrick's assertion we are not a save the world mini game with the love a dating sim is the core game it's, it's the other way around um, but but yeah so so build, we build our cast characters first and then I think from there we kind of we all have the the admittedly slightly uncomfortable talk where we're like okay let's let's talk about sex everyone. <laughs> Right, and 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 we close the door because we don't want the artist getting freaked out. Uh, and there's there is some negotiation. Yeah, I mean, uh, our, we, we it ends up changing a lot of times because we'll do our first pass and say, well, what about this character it can be romance, and this character can be romance, and maybe this one can be romance, and they're gay, and then we do that, and we we sort of look at it like, okay, let's take those characters, let's put that on a chart, and hmm, I mean, and, and it, sometimes it, it's an imbalanced. Or the writer who has that character says, "Well, I, but I, I don't, I don't want to write a, that character as a romance." Or, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll or, or, talk or about better. It. That isn't right for that character. That isn't as right for I, the character. As I've been writing them, yeah. or as I've pictured them, which at that point, that's that's probably the best possible reason to pull them out, or, yeah. or to say, or or the alternate version is what Patrick does, which is, okay, I've got an idea <laughs> <laughs> for a romance, and, and well, I'll be like Patrick, no, go back to your desk. <laughs> You didn't, say, you didn't say no to the safe word idea. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> so, so do you know why I said yes? <laughs> Tell me. Because when he pitched it to me, we were at lunch and my wife was there. And she kind of went... <laughs> <laughs> he should do that. <laughs> And I went, I feel like there's a subtext here. It's not that sub. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Neither is bull. Ba, da, da. Anyway. Uh, so, um, yeah, so, so anyway, start with characters, build them through. Uh, yeah, Dave's right, though. We do, we do gut check, because sometimes we'll be like, yeah, that seems like that could really work. And then we look, and we're like, oh, crap. Uh, sometimes it doesn't work <laughs> because wrong. of what, what it says. Like, like uh, uh, we have, they're too similar. Yeah. Or maybe it's like, Okay, like what? What would those those? What are we saying about that sexuality with that those characters or those choices? And and I mean, uh, uh, there's there's only we will never get it perfect because I mean it's it's not a we can't let the canary sex is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> we we can't let the tail wag the dog yeah. at the end, right? We can't change change all the all the all the characters and you know force writers to 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 write something they don't believe in just to service uh, like like these neat little boxes being checked can happen but we, we got to think about it and, and and give it some consideration and and think about what we're what we're saying even though we're not trying to say it like mm -hmm. when we're inadvertently mm -hmm. saying it because the, the, the part of the, the, the original goal we talked about a while ago was to invite people to play and to give them an experience they but they might enjoy can um, I can I say the, the one thing we truly need to get right though next time what? boy we got to get some dwarf romances <laughs> <laughs> So, so, I knew you were going to say that. So the people who keep tweeting me that, yes, I'm aware. Uh, we will get on it. Um, but that we're not going to start with the box no, that says no, dwarf no. romanceable. But, it's not going to happen. But That's somewhere, somewhere, somewhere at the end of the day, the I will day. probably hold up my cheat sheet of stuff we should probably and go, no. Dwarf romance DLC. 
Yeah. Um, wow. <laughs> all right, so that was such a good question, such a great answer. I think maybe I'm gonna wrap it up. Before I let you guys go, um, really quick, we have a room full of, of uh, people, many of these are students, a lot of them are, are hoping to work in, in game, yep. uh, the game industry and, and become game designers. From your perspectives, for each of your roles on a project like this, what's your advice? Real quick, like, what should they focus on as they're, as they're beginning their career, as they're studying uh, game design, to get to where you guys are now? So the thing that I think is probably the most valuable, and this, this comes partly from my background. I originally started as a critic. So I started at uh, writing reviews, and I, it was, this was around 2000 to 2003, so I got to ride the first dot-com explosion, mm -hmm. and that was fun. <laughs> uh, but but the, thing, the thing that that helped me learn, and I mean, honestly, when I look back at it, I'm like, well, I'd be so much better at that now. But the thing that helped me learn is to be able to look at, at a game and go, okay, so this is what I feel it did really well, and here's what I feel it did you know, somewhat poorly. Mm. Um, that's step one, right? And that, that I think is a really valuable skill to be able to be critical and to be, you know, let's, let's be honest, let's be polite about our critiques, right? Mm. You don't have to be like, and you're bad. <laughs> um, you want to be able to articulate what, what didn't work and what did. But the thing that's really important then is to say, is to go that extra step, especially as game design students, and say, so if I were looking at it, A, can I figure out why that probably ended up shipping the way it did? Because there's always a reason, always a reason. No one ever goes, we'd like to, we'd like this to suck. No one ever does that. <laughs> there's always something that fought, right? You know? um, and the other, the other thing is then to say, if you were given a moderate, modest amount of resources, not like a thousand programmers or anything. Like, what would you do? What what kind of things would you do to address it? Because that set of things I just outlined is going to impress the living heck out of me at an interview. Let me tell you about the last game you worked on, politely, what I felt was particularly strong, what I think you should keep doing, what I think you had some weaknesses on, and what what kind of thought process I have around how you could make that better. And you may not be right, you may not understand, there, you, there's no way you can know why those decisions are made, but you thought about it. You won't offend nice. us. Nice. No. Nobody criticizes our games more than we do. Nice. Mm. How about uh, you two? Uh, uh, <laughs> you know, if somebody comes into an interview for, for writing, um, the thing that probably impresses me quickly is that they did tabletop, that they ran, ran tabletop. <laughs> Hmm. It's, it's, it's really amazing, I, I have found. Like, it's not a guarantee, but chances are if they were a DM or GM, uh, they've got a lot of uh, innate storytelling, which is player-driven. That, that, that there's a lot of skills there that translate over. You're building a story for your players. It's not necessarily your story, but it, you're, it's, it has to change and adapt. It depends on, depending on whether or not you're a good DM. Yeah. <laughs> uh, another one I always tell people, the, the, the other advice I always give is mod. Yeah. Mod. Go out, mod games, get on mod teams. If there's any way you're going to demonstrate, like regardless of your education, if there's any way you're going to demonstrate that you know what we need, uh, modding, show, you, can, you can actually provide something. Uh, I've got two of my writers uh, came to us through the modding community in Neverwinter Nights. Uh, being able to provide something that they could show. Being part of a mod team, if you can get on one, and it's, if you're going to be a writer, that's hard, because you know, if everybody thinks that because they can write a sentence, they can be a writer. <laughs> um, but if you can get on one, you're demonstrating that you can work in a team environment. That's really important, because I mean, uh, we've, we've had people that have come and, and, and wanted to be, be a writer, and they had a, an idea for the entire game, and I, I'll tell you how to do this, guys. Okay, thanks. Stores that way. <laughs> it's like you you gotta be a team player and show that you're willing to not not only critique but accept critique yeah. mm. within the team. That nice. that, that that's uh, very nice. How about you, Freddie, for aspiring actors? Um, you know, I can just speak to you art artistically. Being an artist before you're successful is very lonely, um, as a lot of you probably know. Um, I would say embrace that. When I moved to LA, everybody in my acting class that wasn't booking jobs. We're going out every night and partying every night and having sex with every other student in the class. And I went home every night with scripts and busted my ass on learning how to audition, learning how to break scenes down, understanding that, you know, what my character's obstacle is and how I want to approach getting around this obstacle to accomplish my goal. And that's just on a scene by scene basis. And you heard these gentlemen talk about that on a much grander scale as far as building video games. So embrace the loneliness, use that time wisely i didn't have a lot of friends but i booked a lot more jobs than those guys did and it wasn't because i was better than them i was more prepared than them there were guys in my acting class that couldn't get an agent that could act circles around me that were phenomenal 
but they were out till four o'clock in the morning and they had an audition at 10 a.m. the next day and they sucked and I didn't. So mm -hmm. they didn't get the job and I did, you, you know what I mean? So just take advantage of the time that you have here. Be, excuse my language, but be fucking humble. Mm -hmm. Be humble, be egoless. Walk in and say, I don't know shit because that's how you learn. Mm -hmm. And when I was a teenager, you know, I had a lot of male figures in my life that physically beat that into me. My godfather's Bob Wall. If you don't know who that is, he's the guy who trained Bruce Lee when Bruce came to America. He's no joke. If I didn't get something right the first time, I got hit. <laughs> so, you know, it was, you know, be disciplined. You know, discipline yourselves. Understand that what you're trying to do isn't easy at all. And if it was, every single person in here would already have a game out and you'd already be successful and you'd be sitting right here and people would be asking you questions. It's lonely and it's tough and it's hard, but embrace that time and, and make the most of it and, and, and own it and make it yours. And someone wants to call you a nerd. I got called a nerd a lot. I just took jujitsu, so those guys got choked out. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I, mean? like, I was a DM, so if you made fun of my friends, that was your ass. Like, that's just the way it went. You guys are old enough that you don't have to deal with that now. We live in a wee bit more evolved society where we don't fight over everything a little bit better than we used to be. So just embrace what you're great at and, and focus on it. And that way when you, do, when you do go in and you do get to meet with guys like this and you want a job, you're prepared. There is no such thing as luck. There is no such thing as luck. It's just about being ready. So take that time, take that advice for what it's worth. If, if, if you don't understand it from me, speak to someone else and maybe they can break it down a different way. But stay humble and, and, and embrace that alone time. Use it, use it to your advantage. Don't, don't use it, you know, watching reality TV unless you want to be a reality TV producer. Yeah. <laughs> just to, to add on to that, just really quickly, when I used to mention about modding, what the, the most common reaction I get when I say mod is people look at what it takes to, to, to mod. Like, well, I'll, you know, I have to learn how to, how to do scripting and then maybe some C++ and I'll have to figure out, like, that seems like a lot of work. <laughs> Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> what do, you, do you honestly think that, that I come into work, sort of scribble off a couple of paragraphs, and that's it, I'm done? It is a lot of work, and a lot of it is really unenjoyable and tedious. And then there's, there's that, it is eclipsed by moments of, of you know, sheer awesomeness. But that you have to do the 99% of tedium that is absolutely required. And that, you know, if you actually, if your response is, oh, it seems like a lot of work, and it's like, wow, this thing, this job is so not for you. <laughs> yes, remember. Picasso threw away a lot of canvases before he was selling stuff, you know what I mean? Like exactly, it's the yeah. same for every artist, whether you're a, an actor, a painter, a, a game designer, a director, a, 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 a director of photography, a photographer, you know, whatever it is, it's, it, it can be a lonely life because you're in your head a lot. A lot of us are very introspective. A lot of us become the shrinking violet in the room, right? We, don't, <laughs> we start to like disappear when people are watching us. Fuck that. Like just. My ego's over there somewhere. I check that out. If you guys think I'm cool, right on. If you don't, right on. Like, just don't care. Focus on what your art is, what your craft is, and just kick ass, man. That Sick. is fantastic advice. You guys have been so generous. Thank you very much. This has been awesome. Thank you.